welcome to Slapshot Podcast, episode number 13. I am your host, Chris from Rest. Thank you once again for joining me on the podcast. I was able to stick to my usual routine of doing it on a Wednesday, um, so that's nice. And today's episode of the podcast is going to go a little differently than usual. So if if you don't want to listen or this isn't what you expect and if you only listen to the podcast because you wanted to stick to sports specifically hockey then again you can not listen to this episode you can wait till the next one comes out the fourth you know episode 14 you can just turn it off you can skip to the end if you want it's not going to bother me it's not something that's going to i'm not going to feel attacked i'm not going to feel bad if you tell me that's not what you want to listen to but I feel like it's only fitting that today I get to record this podcast and I got to and I get to talk about two things that are really close to me. I get to talk about hockey, obviously sports, and I get to talk about mental illness. So if you don't know what's going on right today is Bell Let's Talk Day, January 29th. And this started a couple of couple years ago, probably good, a good while where Bell Let's Talk Day. So Bell is a telecommunication company here in Canada. If you if you listen from somewhere else in the world and you don't know, um, and they donate five cents for every uh, call, text, um, what else is it? Uh, if you use the frame on Facebook, um, the filter on Snapchat, Instagram as well, they donate five cents every time you use the hashtag to mental illness. And again, if you if you follow me on Twitter or if we're Facebook friends or whatnot, you probably know a little bit about me and my struggles with mental illness. This isn't that this isn't new, right? And if it is, well, you know, welcome. <laughs> so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time today, well, mostly the entire podcast, talking about mental illness, how it affect affected me, how it still affects me, and the connection that I have to hockey because of mental illness. Because to me, to me, hockey is not just, it's not just a sport, right? And and sometimes people get lost in that, right? To me, it's it's the way I do things. And when I needed help with my mental illness, hockey was a good place to go. And this is, like I said, today is an important day. I've shared my story many times with people. It took me a long time to get there, and now I'm comfortable with it. I'm comfortable with talking to people about it. I'm comfortable listening to people tell me their stories about it. And it's important to me to continue to talk about it and spread awareness for it. Because mental illness is, it's there. People have it. And if you don't know someone who is suffering from mental illness, then they haven't shared it with you yet. If you did a six degrees of something from you, you're bound to know somebody at some point who's dealing with some type of mental illness. This could be depression, right? This can be anxiety, okay? Eating disorders are mental illnesses. Well, there's so many different types of illnesses. And... Like I said, for me, it's something that I've dealt with a really long time. And I'm at the point now where it does not control my life anymore. I'm in control of it. I like to call myself an advocate for it. I call myself a survivor of it. And I will continue to use any platform that I can to raise a well, to raise awareness for mental illness. So if you don't know my story, a little background of it. I'm going to start from the beginning. So this started in 2008, November 4th, 2008. That was my, that was the first moment that mental illness showed up in my life. And for me, it was a time. So I was, I was in Sejep. There was a whole bunch of things that were happening. And I tell people, right, trying to end your life for me, that's what I tried to do. I tried to right kill myself. And for me, that happening was not the worst moment of my mentals. That was a little bit the the tip of the iceberg for me. I didn't talk about my emotions very much. It's not the way we did things at home. 
My parents are amazing people, but we didn't talk about it. And when you bottle things up inside, sometimes you don't know you're bottling them up, right? You don't know how this goes. You just, you, you think it's normal. And at one point, I know where I was. I know what was said to me. I remember it like it was yesterday. I know the exact moment the switch in my head went off. And it took a fraction of a second for me to go from being okay to not wanting to be on the face of the earth anymore to actually trying not to be here. And I don't spend most of my time talking about, you know, what got me there, you know, all this stuff that happened afterwards in the short period of time. To me, that's not, that's not the part I like to focus on because I know it's dark. I know other people are sometimes already there who have been there. I like to talk about the moments that I started to take control of my mental illness because right after I tried to end my life, here's, here's the process of how it gets worse. Right. First off, I failed, obviously, right? And it's hard afterwards in the coming weeks, in the coming months, because there's a heightened kind of awareness to it. And like I said, lots of things were changing in my life at that point. I wasn't even 18. This happened 11 years ago. I was 17 at the time, which, by the way, is, you know, the 15 to 24 age group. They are the most likely to suffer from mental illness. It's the second leading cause of people age 15 to 24 is suicide. And that's that's really high. And it's normal a little bit in a sense. Lots of things are changing. You can grow a lot during that period of time. Life comes at you pretty fast. And we don't always know how to handle it. Or we don't always feel like we have the resources to handle it. And I didn't. I didn't have it. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know how to turn I didn't want to. And even afterwards, I got help immediately afterwards. My parents were awesome. They found a psychologist for me, somebody I could go see. And I tell people that even though I started, I was seeing this person twice a week at the beginning, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And for me, not not being someone who's able to talk about this at the beginning, I wasn't open to sharing it. I just wanted it to go away. I did. I didn't, I felt, I didn't feel normal anymore. And like I said, there's a heightened kind of fear at that point. Because if I didn't answer a phone call, if I didn't answer a text message or or something, or somebody didn't know where I was, their brain would automatically go into panic mode that I might've done it again. And then, like I said, you kind of, when you're depressed for me, Right, Some people have different kinds of symptoms, different kinds of ways to react. Me, it was no sleep, no food. I didn't want to eat. I couldn't sleep. And this went on for probably, I would say, a good three years. So I basically my my diet would consist of air, right? I'd wake up, I wouldn't eat anything. I'd grab a coffee on my way to Sage before collapse. And I'd probably pick up a monster in the right, energy drink in the afternoon. And that was it. That's all I could stomach. That's all I really wanted. I just wanted to go home. I'd go to school, not really care. I just didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be out. I wanted to stay home, lock myself up, and not see the world. And I couldn't do that. I wanted to get better. I didn't know how. And that's the number one thing sometimes with people. They want to get better. They don't know where to start. So here I am, 17, with a whole bunch of people starting to find out. And people will say nice things about how they care and, they, and you can talk to them. But you don't, you, when, you're, when it happens like that and you're not sure how to deal with it, the last thing you want to do is talk about it. So you keep digging a hole away. And your mind keeps running. I couldn't get five minutes in my day where I wasn't feeling like absolute garbage. And for people who are listening right now who are suffering, because I know somebody is. Every year somebody tells me they either suffer from mental illness or they suffered and they're okay. And I know what the feeling is like 
to sit there and listen and say, man, I wish I could do that. Like I said, I didn't know people who were suffering. I didn't. Everybody else seemed normal. That's all I wanted was to be normal. But I didn't know what normal was, right? Grant you, I'm trying not to be on the face of the earth. I, <laughs> that's not normal, right? I didn't know how to talk about it. And it took me, like I said, it took me the better part of three years before I finally decided that I was going to do something about it. And it, uh, I tell people this didn't happen. This didn't happen overnight. It didn't. It was long. It was grueling. I lived as a skeleton of myself. Some days were easier as it went on. Some days were not. But I had a lot of days where it didn't go well. And some of them would beat you up alive. I felt like trash for, like I said, the better part of three years. Every day in the afternoon, specifically around four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And what a lot of people sometimes don't realize is just right there. There's, there's mental fatigue and there's physical fatigue from being mentally ill. And when you have, when, when you put both together, man, you just like, you can't. Right. So put it into context. I'm not eating. I'm not sleeping. I'm running on as much caffeine as humanly possible. And at one point you're going to crash. So you crash in the afternoon. And if you don't have enough energy to fight, you won't make it. Right? I would I would fall asleep in class, in my last class of the day. I'd go home. I can't eat because I feel like vomiting every time I put something in my mouth. And then at some points I figure, well, I'm going to pass out, right? I'm going to fall asleep. No. I stay up at night. And now I'm crying for no reason. And trying to explain to someone, like I said, my dad cared a lot and would ask, you know, what's wrong and what's making you sad. And when people talk about it to me now, they say, Chris, man, I just feel sad. But there's nothing that's making me sad. That right there is the definition of what, to me, what depression is. It's being sad, feeling nothing emptiness, but there's nothing actually causing it. And we're taught that usually something makes you feel that way, right? If something happens in your life that makes you sad, well, you know, just take away the thing that's making you sad or do something that makes you happy. But when you're mentally ill, the things you don't want to do anything that makes you happy. You don't. And me, my safe place for the longest time, was playing hockey. That, that was the only place. I played hockey since I was 10. And during this time now, where I'm, I would say the peak of my mental illness, where I'm really not okay, I'm trying to play hockey. And I can't. I can't do it. I can't leave my problems at the door. Just leave them there play and then on the way out just kind of grab them and say okay let's go we got to keep doing this I guess I couldn't do it there was a small part in life where I just I didn't want to play so I stopped and it was making me angry it was making it worse now mind you I never thought about trying to kill myself twice I never did because I didn't have the energy to do it again I just kind of wanted to hide somewhere and hope that everybody would forget I exist. I kind of describe my depression as a kind of like a shadow. It's right. It's a shadow of you. It has no face, has no ears, has no eyes, has no outline, just a shadow. And it follows you everywhere you go. And it whispers in your ear, just how terrible you are at everything. And it's heavy. It's like carrying a 50 pound bag on you all the time. It just keeps weighing you down and you just wish that you can just take the bag off for a minute, put it down and say, I just want to, like, I just need to rest a little bit. I'll pick it up again because I have no choice because I can't get it away from me, but I just want it to stop for a minute. And that's what people do when they try to end their life. They just try to stop the suffering, 
the pain that they feel for just five minutes. I couldn't get five minutes out of my head, no matter how hard I tried. And it sucked. It absolutely sucked. I wasn't putting myself in any situation to have five minutes though, mind you. And I was, I was going to therapy and I was not talking and I was afraid. I was afraid about talking and about how other people are going to feel about me. Again, my parents are dishing out lots of money because let's not forget, most of the time mental illness is not covered by you know your work insurance, right? It's not covered by, let's say, Medicare. People kind of forget mental illness. It's one of those things that people kind of judge you for. And it's it sucks, right? Because if you go to the dentist, people just say, oh, you, you, know, you should go to the dentist, get your teeth cleaned every year, right? If you, some of your work plans or your work insurance covers, you know, dental, covers cleaning, covers all kinds of things or covers a large percentage of it. But nobody ever talks about saying, hey, I'm going to see my psychologist so I can take care of my, my mental state. And we kind of assume that something's wrong with these people, right? Because anytime we talk about something, right, think of a shooting or something bad, somebody, right, we always associate it with mental illness. Oh, this person committed this crime. They were mentally ill. We, as, we assume as a society that people with mental illness are dangerous, unstable, and they can be violent and commit. And, and for the majority of people suffering, it's not that. We're not more likely to, to, to commit a crime or to hurt somebody else. If anything, we're just hurting ourselves and we're hurting other people indirectly, right? I never felt the need to hurt somebody else. I was doing enough damage to myself that I couldn't, I couldn't have the energy to hurt anybody else. I didn't want to either, but I was doing it, like I said, indirectly. And like, and this went on for a while. This went on for the, like I said, the better part of three years before I finally decided that I had had enough. And I remember what my psychologist said just a little bit before about the problems that I was dealing with. Because I went in there for one thing and kind of like an onion, you unpeel it and you find the root of things and you find out this root has gone back many, many years. And you've been building this up for so long that whatever tipped you over the edge, like in my case for me, that was probably not even the problem. It wasn't, but all the stuff before that, that stuff we got to deal with and we got to work on it. And I didn't want to at first. I didn't trust. It's it's, no, sorry. It's not that I didn't trust her. I didn't trust me. I was afraid so many mornings to wake up and start my day because I didn't trust myself to not be able to have that switch go off again. It's terrifying when you don't trust yourself. If you asked me 10 years ago where I would be today, I probably, I I would have said I'm not here. It doesn't matter. I won't make it. Right in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, I don't need to really complete school. I'm not going to be here. I don't have to worry about a future. I'm not going to have one. I'm not going to make it. And when you say it enough, it creeps into your head and you're just self-sabotaging yourself. But that's all I could do until one day, right? I was, I went to go see a psychiatrist because I thought maybe some medication would help me feel better. And I wrote about this uh, a couple of years back. I think it, uh, over two and a half years ago, I, I, I wrote a, a, an article for Sick Not Week, which you should check out, um, right? Sick Not Week is an organization. So if you don't know Michael Landsberg, right? He has mental illness and he talks about it. And he started this this campaign in a way where people can share their stories about mental illness. And I, I became an ambassador with them and I shared my story with them. And I shared the story about the exact moment when it clicked for me. I said, I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing. And I remember the, con- the conversation I had with me lasted about 15 seconds at most. Right? I'll post the the article over um, in the article section at the Fantasy Fix, or you can find it 
directly on my Twitter page at Fuzzy Chris ninety one. I'll post it somewhere if you want to read it. In short, it's right. I I go see the psychiatrist now because I think well maybe I need some medication, and some people do. And again, the stigma is is still very much there. Okay, there's a whole lot of people in life who take medication to live. Right, you think about someone with diabetes taking insulin. You think about someone with blood thinners, with blood clots, taking all kinds of medication to keep them alive. But when you hear somebody tell you that they're taking a Xanax, right, you kind of look at them a little differently. Because I, I know this because I've seen people do it. And yet, there's no difference between taking a pill as a blood thinner to make sure you don't have a heart attack and taking a Xanax to help you calm down. Sometimes you can abuse it, right? And people do. But a lot of people take it because taking medication can help balance them out. Find a little bit of relief. Because again, that's all I was looking for. Just five minutes. I couldn't get a string of five minutes into my day not feeling like trash. Now, I'm not putting in the work, obviously, because I'm not talking to the person who my parents pay for so they can help me get better. I'm not talking to this person. I'm, 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 I'm not giving her all the information she needs to do her job. She's trying, and she's did a great job. I saw her for five years, right? So I remember going to see the psychiatrist, and he prescribes a medication. I said, perfect. I'm going to cheat my way out of this one. That's right. The medication is going to make me feel better, which, A, it doesn't, right? That's not how it works. And I say, I'm going to feel fine. Gives him medication. He says, come back next week. We'll do a follow-up. I take the medication for about seven days, okay? Worst seven days I've ever had. All over the place, I probably felt worse than ever. Now, mind you, I'm sitting here going, man, I'm looking, this medication is supposed to help me, and I feel even worse. What's up, doc? Because I went back and I told him, and I see him on his paper, he's writing it down, he's taking his notes, and he says, fine, we'll we'll adjust the dose. Go back, get some more. And take this much. And I said, no, 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 wait a minute. What, you mean take more? I don't want to take more. I feel like trash. If I wanted to feel like garbage, I'd just continue doing what I'm doing, right? And then I learn a little bit more about how antidepressants work. And this is a trial and error kind of thing, right? You got to find the right dosage for you. A little bit too much, a little bit too little. It's not going to take effect. And once you do find that right, that sweet spot, well, it takes a couple of weeks for it to get it. Mind you, there's, there's side effects to it, obviously. And I'm sitting in his office. And I'm saying, man, I'm playing Russian roulette with my life. Like I have no idea when I'm going to feel better. But I'm supposed to sit here, feel like this. Again, mind you, I don't trust myself yet. I don't. So I got to feel like this, take this medication. It's going to probably take me who knows how many weeks to feel better. And then I could be on this forever. Or they could slowly, gradually try to take me off because you can't just stop antidepressants. You slowly come off them. For what? So I can cheat myself out of this? He gives me the prescription. I leave his office. I don't make a follow-up appointment with the receptionist. I just walk by. Grab my coat. I'm out the door. It's February, right? So it's cold. I get in the elevator. The doors close. And that was it. In the time it took the elevator to go from whatever floor he was on to the ground floor, I told myself, I said, that's it, Chris. You're done. I'm sick and tired. Feeling sick and tired. I've had enough. I'm going to get better. That was the moment I took control of my life. I had had enough. And I tell people sometimes, and man, you're going to change or you're going to take control of your life when you're sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. When you've had enough, sometimes people tell me they've had enough and I'm like, wait a minute, you're going to, there's a point where you're going to flip. You're going to flip that switch to the other side and you're going to put the pedal down and you say, that's it. I'm not going back. I can't. I don't want to. I've had enough. In the time, like I said, it took maybe the elevator 15 seconds for the doors to close, hit the ground floor, open again so I can get out. 15 seconds is all it took me to make a commitment to myself that I was cheating myself and I don't understand why I'm not feeling well, right? 
I'm the guy crushing McDonald's three times a week. Sitting there going, well, why don't I look like Brad Pitt? Why am I not gaining it? Why am I not healthy? Well, of course you're not healthy, moron. You're not doing anything. You're cheating yourself. I was cheating myself, so I stopped. That was the day I took control of my life. That's the part I talk about the most. Because I know somebody's waiting and they're saying, man, I don't know when. And it doesn't matter when, right? Today is a day where the light is, the spotlight is on mental illness. And mental illness likes to live in the dark in a corner very quietly so it can tell you what a, how awful you are. It doesn't want light, doesn't want attention. And today we're shining. And that light may be too strong for some people today. And you don't have to share it today. If today's too much attention, wait. Do it when you're ready. Because somebody's going to be there to listen to you when you're ready. Somebody will. Just like somebody was there to listen to me when I finally said, hey, okay, I'm ready to talk about this. I'm ready to share with me, with you, what's bothering me, and I'm ready to work on getting better. And this took three years to get to that point. This didn't happen overnight. I hear a lot of people sometimes who talk to me and say, well, you did it. How did you do it? Man, it took me three years of feeling like trash. And then even then, after I decided, there were days that were not easy. This isn't easy. This isn't a thing that you do and then you're fine. At least it's not for me. This is something I work on every single day of my life, 24-7. It took a lot of work with my psychologist so I can be built to a certain way. So that I can succeed and survive. I kept seeing her regularly and we developed a toolbox. I have tools that I use. A lot of it requires a lot of time for myself. It does, but that's the way I've been built now. I've I've been programmed like a computer to run a certain way. I take a lot of time for myself to make sure I'm okay. And that time for myself a lot is doing something I enjoy, which is watching hockey. I watch hockey. I play hockey. I'll watch as much as I humanly can. I don't care what game is on TV. I'm going to watch it. I don't care if it's NHL, AHL, KHL, I mean, Swedish Elite League, junior hockey. I'll watch it. I watch hockey because it's something I enjoy, and it helps balance me out. It's my drug of choice, right? I could have turned to drugs, alcohol. I didn't do that. I chose to watch hockey at a ridiculous amount. And does that cause problems? Of course. That's my girlfriend sometimes. It's like, all you do is watch hockey. Yeah, that's all I do, actually. But she knows why. She understands why. She doesn't always like it. And I try to do my best as well to not get sucked into that because too much of anything is no good for you, right? But for me, hockey is what helps me get away from the world for a minute. And the tools that I have afterwards is to work on when that depression creeps back because... I'm not going to lie to you, it has. Of course it is. October's a tough month for me. It's tough. I hate it. I hate October. As great as hockey starting and football is there and baseball playoffs, everything happens in October, right? I hate the month because bad things seem to happen. It's mental for me, right? Don't forget, this is mental. This is in my head. 11 years later, I still have a hard time with October. October 2016 shows up and this is right. This is the first time since I decided to take control of my life that life really threw something at me and said, Hey, okay, let's see what you're made of now. The whole, this, that, that period in time, there were things changing in life that I didn't want. I didn't necessarily like, but they were going to happen whether I liked it or not. And this was the first time that I felt I was losing the grip that I had gained for so long, right? Mind you, I've gone now many years of being okay. Some days less cool than others, right? Still some sadness here and there. But this, but, but October 2016, that month was when I saw the symptoms coming back. And I, granted, I know what they feel like. I know when I'm not sleeping. I know when I'm not eating. 
that it's there. My depression is knocking on the door saying, hey, I'm back. Let's get comfortable. And I don't want to. I've had enough. I haven't seen depression in a long time. And through all the work that I've done since 08, right? Even the point where I didn't do anything. Till that point, I developed a whole bunch of tools. And I said, all right, let's go. And there were days where, man, I didn't like it. I wasn't feeling good. I even tried to cheat myself. I tried to go see, right, psychologist, someone different, see if they could help me with something. Again, I was trying to cheat, say, hey, maybe they'll help me. You know, maybe I'll get something. Maybe they'll help me. I, I went, I didn't like it very much. I didn't feel like I was, and, and again, I stopped myself and I said, man, Chris, you're cheating yourself again. You have all the tools you need. Use them. Stop trying to run away from this. You did it once, didn't work. Don't do it again. Don't let this slip. I was so afraid to slip. I was afraid to fall back into that pattern that I was feeling all those years ago. I was afraid that I'd fall back into the patterns from eight years ago, and I was not going there. I, I'm, I'm still terrified of it because I know just how much it sucked for me and everybody that was around me at that time. So now I'm, Right, I, I leave and I again, I don't make a follow-up appointment. I think I went twice and I said, no, 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 Chris. We're going to use the tools that you have. We're going to do it one day at a time. And these tools are different for every person. What works for me may not work for you. And they don't have to be complex either. So what I did every night, because again, I was starting to realize that, man, I wasn't sleeping very well. So I made sure that my nutrition was on point. I was eating stuff. I didn't like it. And sometimes it took me a while to eat. There were times where I threw up, but I kept shoving food, good food in my mouth to make sure that when four o'clock came around the next day, I wasn't tired. I wasn't hungry. I had the energy needed. So me and depression can dance a little bit. I knew it was going to come no matter what. So I had to be ready. I had to. I said, you got to be ready. And sometimes it was fine. I kept myself occupied at four o'clock. There were a lot of times where I did things. Or I'd make sure that my, I was working at that point. I made sure I was busy. I didn't take a lunch break at four from four to five or five to six. I was busy. I kept moving. I made sure I was out with friends. I had great friends. Make sure that I was okay at the beginning. And this time I knew that I didn't need, like, I didn't need to tell them, hey, I'm not doing well. I need, I just, I made plans with them. Again, I just wanted to feel a little bit normal. And I had some friends who took excellent care of me, man. Excellent care of me at that point. And one of my friends, right, he was living with his roommate. He had a condo. And I remember when, you know, all this stuff was going wrong, right? He comes to me and he gives me a key and he says, hey, anytime you want to come over, just sit in the condo, hang out or whatnot. Anytime you want, just walk in. And I felt so relieved because somebody at this point now, without doing much, they didn't, right, don't forget, they didn't do anything. They gave me a place to go if I needed to hide. Just arbitrary. Just say, hey, just, just walk in. You're welcome anytime you want. And I told myself, I said, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Not Maybe not all the time, but I'm going to take it up. I'm going to go at least once. At least once a week or maybe twice, whenever. So I can hang out with my friends. Just so I could be there. Because I knew if I was alone, I knew what was going to happen. I ran the risk of falling back into that depression that I was so afraid of. And I took out all the tools. I used every tool in the box. That's why I said 2016, October 2016 was the first time I had to dig into the toolbox and pull everything out and say, okay, let's go. And if 2008 Chris was in that position, man, he would have folded in 10 seconds completely. Would he be here? No idea. He would not have been ready. I had worked so long to get to that point now that I said, I got this, man. I'm going to do it. And sometimes it was, it was simple things. I would write down a positive, either a word, 
a sentence, a phrase, something. I'd, I'd write it down on a post-it and I'd stick it on my wall before going to bed, before going to bed. Right? I tried to make it the last thing I thought about. I put a post-it and I'd listen to some, you know, relaxing music, anything you want. You can do meditation music. I enjoy rainforest music. I'll just listen to like, you know, like a rainforest or like a rain kind of falling. I would play that and I just try to ease my body. I'm putting the post on the wall and I'd put the post it every single time. So that every day when I woke up, I'd see the post-its because after time I'd have a couple. And I'd remind myself that when I start my day, you get a clean slate and it's going to be how you decide to go about it. I didn't have a problem starting my day off. Well, I, I wasn't waking up depressed. I was usually ending it that way. So I knew I had everything I needed to start my day on the right track. Mind you, again, this is eight years later and I'm still at that point where I was a little bit vulnerable and unsure. Did I make it? Absolutely, I did. I started to feel that I was getting the grip back. I started to feel like I was in control of myself. That's what I tell people. Your depression is going to try to control you. You have to control it back. And it's fine if there's days where you don't feel well or you lose. And your depression tells you, well, you know what? Go sit somewhere in a corner for a little bit. Feel like trash about you being such a terrible person. You know it's not true. So I tell people sometimes just just live, feel the emotion. Let you feel it, man. If you need a good cry, cry it out. Cry the whole damn way. And then once you're done, now that you've done it, now you got to pick yourself up and say, okay, well, now I got to do something different. I got to fight back just a little bit. Sometimes I'd be tired, so tired. I just pass out. It's fine. I was asleep. I wanted to sleep when I was depressed. I wanted to. So I told myself, if I sleep for eight hours or 10 hours, let's say I sleep for eight hours. Well, then I only have 16 hours in my day that I have to worry about this. There's only 16 hours I have to hear about how miserable I am and how terrible I am and how maybe this is slipping out of my hands again. And I'm going to go back to where I was and I don't want to go back to where I was and I don't want to start over again. I've been through too much. That's when I started to feel it. I said, okay, well, I got this. And I used all kinds of things. I read somewhere, right? So I would take a piece of paper and I'd write something down on it. And I would write something because I would beat myself up about things that happened in the past. So I'd write down that thing from the past, right? I'd crumple it into a ball and I'd throw it in the garbage. And I told myself, I'm only going to do that if I'm really willing to let it go. You have to let it go. Because now you put it down on a piece of paper, you threw it out. That's it. You're not getting it back. You can't go back and get it. When you forgive yourself for what you've done, you're going to be fine. And I would do that with a couple of things. I'd have a journal. I'd write down things. I'd write letters to myself just on a piece of paper. And I tell myself in the future when you read this, because at one point I knew I wasn't going to keep writing. I didn't need to. I said, but when you, when, when, when you write in this book, you'll be able to look back, see where you were. And I can only write encouraging things in this book. Nothing else. I was encouraging myself. So I would have to grab myself at a moment where I was feeling good and write it down. So usually I'd do this at night after I'd write down on the post-it, I'd write in the book and I'd tell myself that I'm proud of me and that this is temporary and tomorrow's going to be better and next year is going to be even better too and you're going to make it and all this that you're feeling right now, you're not going to remember it at some point. It's not going to consume your life like it used to. Don't worry about falling backwards. Maybe you're only taking a couple of steps back, but you're going to keep moving forward at some point. It's okay not to feel okay. And it, and, and it took me a couple of weeks, not going to lie. It took me a couple of weeks, and then I got out of it. I know because I started not to feel so bad about myself. I started good, other good things started to happen. 
and it kind of just went away. And then one day I kind of looked up and I said, you know, I wasn't putting any post-its on the wall anymore. I didn't need to. I didn't need to write in my journal. I didn't need the music to fall asleep. I was sleeping regularly again. I was eating things. I was so happy. I remember, you know, I didn't eat. I was eating stuff and it was taking me forever. I was so happy when I, I I think I had like a hamburger or something. And I ate it in like five minutes, like like a normal person. And I was so happy that I was able to eat something without actually feeling like I needed to throw up. Right? Some people eat too much when they're depressed. They don't stop. Me? I couldn't. I couldn't eat. You go somewhere, a restaurant, you order nothing, basically. I was so happy that I got back to where I was. And I remind people that I'm, I'm a product of what I am. And I put in the work every single day to make sure that I am the best at what I am. And when you get, when you gain those tools, right? When everything's going well, you, you think you have control, but it's when it starts to slip a little bit that you're going to be like, okay, let's find out what I've really learned. Let's find out what I can do. And I did it. I do it every day. Do I have days where I feel less okay? Of course. A couple months ago, I just, I didn't feel right. I was feeling sad. I didn't know why. But it lasted a couple of days. I wasn't sure why. I was going back and I was like, I was breaking down film basically of my life. I was like, what did I do that day? Or what did I do here? Why am I feeling like this? Like, is it the sun? Is it cold outside? Is that what's, like, I didn't know. Then I pulled out a couple more tools. I talked about it. All of a sudden it went away. And now, now when I feel sad, I know that I can, I can deal with it. I have what I need to get by it. And it breaks my heart every time, man, that I read a story about somebody who didn't make it. Like sometimes I don't know these people, right? I don't know you know, Derek Bugard personally. I don't know Wade Belak personally. I don't know Rick Rippon personally. But these people lost their lives due to mental illness. I remember hearing about it and I was like, man, that's sad. Kate Spade, Robin Williams. Like Robin Williams was the happiest person on earth, right? And he wasn't happy. These are like, I tell people that depression is like, it, it looks like me. These are, we're, we're regular people. We're not okay. And I wish that I wish to one day live in a world where mental illness is treated like every other illness on the face of the earth. That it's not that people don't wake up feeling that it's a sign, that it's a sign of weakness. It's not, but we're brought up to believe that it's weak to feel emotions, especially men. Like men, we are taught to be strong. Nothing bothers us. You, d- you bottle your emotions up. You don't have time. The same thing with hockey. We're taught to be strong. We got to be there. We got to push through. We don't have time for emotions. And that's so dangerous to suppress all that. Because one day, it just switches. It's a switch. It took me no time. To go from, man, I'm having a shitty day, man, I'm not feeling good, to, by the way, I don't want to, I, I, to, I don't want to be on the face of the earth anymore, and I'm going to take an action to make sure that I'm not. It took three seconds to go from there. There's 24 hours in a day, and three seconds can change your life and everyone standing around you. And I feel lucky because I'm still here. And other people are not. What makes me different from them? I feel lucky because I got the help. I got the help that I needed. And I wish, I wish that people had work organizations that, you know, had a significant amount of money so people can go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I wish that prescription medication that, you know, Xanax is covered under your work stuff. I wish the 
the government has, you know, subsidies for medication that you pay for. I wish those medications were part of it. I wish my employer gave me a large budget so I could go see a psychologist regularly, not just once a month. That's not enough for some people. It's not enough. It's expensive therapy. I know that. And there are people right now who are suffering from mental illness or, and are not going because they don't have the money to. And that's sad. So that's why I talk about it. Because maybe somebody will just turn to me and say, hey, man, I just want to talk. And I'll talk with them. I don't care about what. And I'm not there to solve their problems. Like people get confused. I, at, at that point, when I was feeling at my worst, I didn't need somebody to solve my problems. I had somebody. I wasn't talking to them very much. I didn't need them to, like, I, I didn't need my friends to solve my problems. I just needed them to listen about whatever it was. I just needed them sometimes to be there. I've sat with people and not said a word. And I said, you know what? Look, we don't need to talk about it. I'm just going to sit here. Okay. I'm just going to sit. We're just going to do our thing. And if you need to talk about it, I'm just going to listen. I'm not going to judge you, right? People know that. People who know me know that they can come and talk about it with me, and I'm not going to judge them. I'm going to tell them they just feel that they're just normal. They're just like a lot of other people. I just want them to feel like they're not different because I didn't want to feel different. And even when people used to tell me that you know they don't believe in depression. They don't believe in medication. Why can't you just be happy? Why can't you get over it? Like that stuff doesn't bother me anymore. It doesn't. Because I just chalk it up to this person doesn't know anybody in their entourage that's suffering. So that means everybody around him is okay. And that's a blessing. It's a blessing that they've never had to go through that kind of exhaustion that kind of physical and mental exhaustion that depression brings you they've never had they don't understand what it's like to cry at 3 a.m in the morning for no reason how can i fault them for that i'm not going to sit there and yell at them they don't understand i can accept their ignorance that's fine i'm okay with it i don't get mad at people who tell me it doesn't exist I don't, get, I don't get mad at people who say, oh, this, this Bell Let's Talk thing is just a publicity stunt and it just, you know, it's just a, it's, it's just marketing for them. Yeah, it's marketing. I don't care. It's one day that I get to talk about it with people and everybody, like, they're more aware. Like, we should be doing it all year round, of course, but now they're more aware. It brings awareness to something that lives in the dark. Like we're opening up and we're telling people, hey, look, maybe on the 4th, you know, on the, I don't know, the 4th of June, you know, I might not be as aware because it's in the back of my mind and it's far away. But today, today I'm aware. I'm talking about it. I'm taking a moment to remember. It's an important cause. It's important to me. It's important to everybody else. I had places to go. I had things to do. I fell in love with a sport. That took care of me. Hockey took care of me when I needed it. Because then I got good at just going to the rink. And just leaving whatever was that, whatever was bothering me at the door. That's it. Because I was playing hockey with people at first who didn't know what was bothering me. They didn't know. I wasn't Chris with depression. I was just Chris. I was just there to play hockey. I was treated as an equal. I was the same as them. Meanwhile, I'm leaving the arena... And I feel like trash. But for three hours, I didn't have to worry about that. So instead of having to fight for 24 hours, I only got to fight for, I don't know, 22. And and then I got to get eight hours of sleep. I got to try. I got to not wake, not open my eyes early in the morning. I'm going to bed late. I became a night owl because of it. But it didn't matter. Hockey played the biggest role in my life at that point. Making sure I had somewhere to just go and blow off a little bit of steam. Because I was angry. Of course I was. I was angry at myself. But I get to take that out on an 
eight ounce puck. I can shoot as hard as I want at the goalie. I didn't need to worry about that. That's what I was there for. That was just normal. There were people there, you know, high-fiving me on my team, telling me that, you know, good job I did. Nice back check, nice this, nice that. We're a team. It doesn't matter. They don't look at me different. I have a number. That's it. A number with a name on the back of my jersey. That's all I am. It doesn't say I'm depressed. I'm the same as everybody else on that ice. That's where I found my refuge. And people sometimes think that this can happen to you, right? People say it happens to somebody else. Or the most common ones is, you know, with people who play sports well, you know, what do you have to be sad about? You're a millionaire, man. You play a sport for a living. Like, imagine. That's how much depression doesn't care. It doesn't care what you do. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care if you're a man or a woman, black, white, rich, or poor. It doesn't care. It doesn't discriminate at all. Sometimes people tell me, well, you know, why would you want to kill yourself and leave your family and your friends? I can't, I can't, I can't understand why somebody would do that. Like imagine how ill you got to be to, to take yourself off the planet and hurt all these people around you. It's an illness. It's a mental illness. It's not a disease, Right. You cannot catch mental illness by being next to somebody who has it. That's not how this works. I know people sometimes like, oh, I, 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 I don't want to be around this person. They depress me. That's not how it gets. Like, that's not how it works. It's not contagious. It's not the flu. You can't get depressed from somebody else. And when people are feeling stuff that they're not okay, sometimes I just check up. Or I'll just be there. Or I'll just say, hey, man, if you want to talk, go ahead. I'll listen. I got time. I'll make time. I don't care. Because I wish I would have known the resources that were around me at that time. So I could bother somebody and say, hey, man, I'm not okay. I need to talk to you. Can you listen? I will always give people my time if they need it. If they just want to talk about something. Maybe they just want to exchange an idea with me about something. I don't care. I'll talk about it. I'll talk as little as you need me or as much as you need. I don't like, I don't care. What do you need? What do you need me to help you with? I can't solve your problems. I always tell them I can't solve them. By the way, I'm not a paid professional. That person is going to give you the tools that you need to make it work. You're going to build your own toolbox, but I'll share with you some of my tools that I have. And maybe one of them or two will work. Maybe they won't, by the way, maybe they won't. Maybe you'll feel a lot worse. I always tell people you, you might feel worse. Tomorrow might not be easy but you got to work on it every day. And I need to, I will, I will work on it every single day for the rest of my life. And I accept it. I'm okay with it. I've been built a certain way. Sometimes I don't even need to talk to somebody else. I've become so good where I can talk directly to myself and say, Hey man, chill out a bit. If you're not having a good day, take a time out, regroup, sit down, take a moment, Pace yourself. You don't have to do everything at once. Whatever's bothering you, some of it's going to be there tomorrow. Maybe it doesn't matter. Tackle this part first. Get to tomorrow later. Cross this bridge before you get to the other one. I do what's best for me. I become good at being able. And sometimes I need to talk to somebody else. I just need to. Or sometimes I go out because I know. I said, man, this, this might be tough. I know myself. I studied myself. I needed to know. I needed to know who I was, what's going on. How do I beat this? How do I take control of it? How do I see it coming from every angle? It's like playing chess. Like you got to be three steps ahead of your opponent. You got to know what's coming. I don't like surprises. I don't. I don't take just risks. I don't wake up one morning and say, hey, I'm going to go backpacking through Europe. No, I don't do that. I can't. I need to know. I need to plan it out. I need to evaluate things from every angle. Does that always work? No, of course not. Does it, does it frustrate people? Yeah, of course. You know, I would never just be like last minute go somewhere. I can't. I got to plan it. I got to know where are we going? Where are we staying? What time do we leave? How's the traffic? I build that the same way because that's how I deal. That's how I dealt with my mental illness. 
you know, what can I do if I feel like this? What can I do if I feel like that? What if this person says this? How do I react to that? You know, what if four o'clock comes around and I'm not busy? What am I going to do? I programmed myself with the help of an amazing professional to make sure that everything that was coming, I was ready. And I do it every single day. And there are lots of days that are easy. Lots of them. This isn't a battle anymore. This isn't, you know, I was trying at, at, at first to just have five good minutes. That's it. Just have five good minutes. And then five minutes became 10. 10 became 20. 20 became an hour, an hour, two hours, two hours, six hours, a day, now two days, now a week, couple of weeks, couple months. Now, days where I feel like trash are few and far in between. Do I have them? Yes. Will I have them? Yes. Does that mean it's the end of everything and my world's falling apart? No. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I'm not going to win every battle. I know that. And I don't need to. Because I'm going to keep updating my toolbox with things. I'm going to keep learning about myself. I'm going to evolve. Because as, as life evolves, right, so do some of my tools have to evolve. But I can do all this now without needing to see somebody. I have all the tools that I need in my box now. And I use these tools to help me get better. And when I finally decided I was able to talk about it, I remember sharing it. I was a little bit afraid at first. I was like, man, how are people going to react? Because like most of the people around me knew. But I wanted to share it with just complete strangers. I said, maybe it's, it's, it's going to help somebody. I have all this, all this power now. I have control of my life. I got to share it with somebody. I got to share it with people. I got to show them that I'm a success story too, that I made it. And that if I can do it, they can do it. And that maybe they need to talk to somebody so we can do it together. That's why I share it. And I know not everybody's able to do it. Some people tell me they're not okay and they keep it to themselves. And that's fine. Everybody knows how far they want to go. Everybody knows how much attention they want to, you know, draw to it. I'm okay with where I am today. When I decided to tell people, you know, the the reaction was positive. Thank you for sharing your story with us, Chris. Thank you for telling me. I want other people to share their story if they can or if they want to. And if you're listening and you're not able to do it, that's fine. You're not a failure because you can't talk about it yet. You may be where I was 11 years ago. I just want you to know that like it's, it's, you're going to make it. You're going to be okay. It's going to suck. Yeah. A lot. But you're going to make it and you're going to be fine. And I stress the people to talk about it. Talk about it with somebody. It doesn't have to be somebody you, you know, then not everybody is equipped for it. And to the people who are listening, sometimes it's heavy. And if you can't deal with all of it, you know, be honest with the person. Hey man, this is, this is a lot. Have you thought about, you know, going to see somebody who can really help you? I'll listen to you. But you got it. Like, like I said, you're not there to solve their problems. Help them. Help them get the help that they need. Because once they get the help, once they walk in there, they may not like it. I didn't like it at first. I didn't want to go. I wanted to feel better, but I didn't want to go. Right? I mean, how does that work? And there was not. Sometimes I would go to my session and I didn't enjoy it. I didn't want to walk in, but I always walked out feeling a whole lot better. And it was tough at the beginning because I would, you know, I'd go on a Thursday and then by Monday, Tuesday, even Wednesday, I was like, I was not okay. Like I needed to go back so I can talk. Like, again, I was going, I wasn't talking, but I could go and I could hide a little bit. I could let her talk, ask me questions where I can just answer yes or no. But I'd walk out feeling a little bit better. Then it was a long drive home. It was about 45 minute drive home afterwards. I'd just sit in the car in silence. My dad would just drive me home. He would go with me. He'd bring me, he'd finish work, pick me up. 
travel out there. You know, he'd have to get lost or go have a coffee and sit for an hour by himself, basically. Wait, pick me up, go home. And I appreciated every moment of it. And it was the best, the best investment I made in myself. Is getting the help that I needed to be a better person. And now I just want to share it with as many people who will listen. And like I said, if you don't believe it, you don't want to hear it, I don't waste my time with people who don't care. That's fine. I don't lose sleep over that. I'm going to focus my attention on somebody who wants to listen. I'm going to keep my eyes and ears open for somebody who has the signs of it. And I I know what it looks like sometimes. I'm going to make myself available for people. I'm not going to sit there and yell on the internet to people who are telling me that they don't believe in medication and just cheer up because somebody in Africa isn't eating. I don't have time for that. I don't have time. Somebody's going to end their life today because they weren't able to talk about it. It might be somebody I don't know, but it could be somebody I do know. And I'm not going to take time out of my day and waste it somewhere else when I could spend it with somebody who just wants me to listen to them. So again, if you're having a hard time, you can talk to me. Maybe we don't know each other yet, by the way. Maybe we don't. But it's fine. I'll listen to you. I will always listen. And if you want to be somebody who listens, tell people. Tell, just tell people you'll listen and then, and then listen though, right? Like if you tell people you listen and you're going to be there, be there but make yourself available. Say hi to people you don't know. Talk to people you don't know. You never know what they need. You never know how much your conversation is going to matter to them. You have no idea the impact you can have positively or negatively on somebody. You don't know. You don't know what shoes they're walking in yet. Make yourself available. Ask questions. If you want to help, help. And there's so many resources now. You know, the internet sometimes is a miserable place, but it can be a good place too. And there's so much information available to people who want to help and just come up with, like I said, these tools don't have, it's not rocket science here. Post-its are not rocket science. That's what worked for me. This isn't rocket science sometimes. Do what you need to do to get better. It's, it's, it's going to get worse sometimes. But trust yourself. You have to trust yourself that you're going to make it. You can't doubt yourself because you, you are your best supporter. You got to believe that you can. It's tough waking up in the morning and saying, man, I don't trust myself to come back to bed tonight. I don't know if I can make it. That's tough. That starts your day off on a really bad note. You're starting two spots back and you don't have the energy to move five from the starting point. Trust yourself. Trust the people around you. Open up to one person you trust. And I guarantee you they will take it. And the first time you open up and somebody says, man, thanks for sharing that with me. Me too, I feel that way. I remember the first person I talked to And they said, yeah, me too, man. I've been there before. What? You're feeling what I'm feeling? The first time I got to talk to somebody who said, man, I understand what it's like to just cry for no reason and feel ashamed and guilty, but haven't, haven't done anything. I mean, what a relief. I didn't have to explain why I was sad. They just knew. They said, yeah, I get it. I understand. I've been there. It took so much weight off me. I didn't have to explain. This person knew. This person was in my shoes. They've been here before. You've been where I am and you are where you are now. I can get there too. That's the best feeling in the world ever. But talk about it. Talk about it today. Talk about it every day. Do the work every single day. And I guarantee you, you'll get through it. I do.
You'll get there. You will. It's going to take some time, but you'll get there. But together, as a, as a society, if we end the stigma, if we stop making people feel like they're garbage, because like I said, if you're dealing with mental illness, you're doing it yourself, man. You don't need anybody else helping you. Talk about it. Get the help. Go to what just... Go see somebody just once and then go again and keep going because one day, one day it's going to be a habit. You may not want to go every time. You may not like it, but you'll go and you'll talk about things and you'll resist a little. And then one day you're going to, it's just going to be second nature. You're going to go and you're going to love it. You're going to get all these tools. And then one day like me, life's going to throw it at you. They're going to throw the whole, everything at you. They're going to throw the whole kitchen sink at you and they're going to say, okay, Let's see if you've really learned here. Let me test you again. And now you're going to have a real opportunity to shine. And when I came out of that 2016, man, did I feel good. It was a battle for a couple of months, but I felt good. I said, I did it. I got past this. It wasn't that bad, actually. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was. I had learned so much. And I know life at some point down the road is going to test me again. It's going to throw this time probably the kitchen sink and something else. I don't know when, but I work on it every single day. So I'll be ready when that moment arrives. If you're here still, if you listen to the whole thing, man, thank you for listening. I know it's a lot about me and like I said, I just, I needed to share. I felt like what a time to be able to talk about this today with everything going on. So I appreciate it if you listen. And if you want to talk about something with me, you again, you can find me on Twitter at FuzzyChris91. Slide into the DM, man. Tell me. I'll listen. I don't care if I know you or if I don't. I'll listen to you. You can slide in. Maybe you don't want to slide into me. You can slide into the podcast at Slapshot Podcast. If you want, I'm just, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to talk about this today and I'm happy to share it with people because I know at some point somebody is listening and they're going to need this. And if I helped you, cool. If I didn't, that's, that's okay. And if you're telling me you're not ready, that's okay too. There's no perfect strategy to this. But if I can help just one person feel a little bit better for five minutes, then my work here is done. I appreciate all of you. I appreciate everybody who reaches out to me. And we're going to do this again next week as well. Again, don't forget, talk about it. Be kind to those you don't know. And together we can change the world. Thank you.